Praise the Lord, everybody. It's good to be in the house of God. Uh, I'm going to ask all everybody to stand up with us and worship with us. Uh, I'm going to introduce us with a word of prayer real quick. Lord, thank you for bringing us today. God, thank you for bringing us here through this week. God, thank you for getting us through this week, through classes, through jobs, through whatever you brought us to. And Lord, we thank you for bringing us to this place, Lord, this place of worship, God. And I pray that you would just help us to concentrate on you today, Lord, to give you everything, Lord, to give you our all. And Lord, we praise you, Lord, and we're going to give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name.
Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Father.
how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in a spirit of unity. Amen. Amen. Bless God. All right, we're going to, uh, I'm going to introduce to you um, a friend of mine. Um, I met him last year. And soon as I met this young man, he cracked the joke. And those that know me, I'm very jovial and, you know, joking, like, okay. He has the same fabric as me. But I've grown in the relationship with this man, and he's a great, 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 great brother. Um, he's very knowledgeable and um, very caring and has a sense of humor. Um, I do call him a friend. A real friend, not an associate, but a friend, you know what I mean? And I just believe that God has some things on his heart that he has to share for us. I'm going to introduce to you my brother, um, Brother Victor Jones, amen? amen? Give a hand clap of praise. Is that okay? All right. Hey, Amen. How everybody feeling? Good. 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 School ain't got you down too bad, does it? All right. Pardon me. Let me get set up. All right. So um, it's just an honor to be up here in front of you guys. It's an honor to be in the land of the living. It's an honor to have a privilege to be used by God another day. I uh, want to give honor. So. All right. Better? All right. want to give honor to the shepherd and first lady of this house, pastor and first lady. Um, so today, I want to talk about something that I feel like we all are plagued with. Um, well, it's scripturally based that we're all plagued with it. But I, if I had to title it, I would call it, We Cannot Stop the Birds from Flying Over Our Head, But We Can Prevent Them from Making a Nest in Our Hair. Um, so, I mean, we understand that we're all tempted. We're all going to be tempted. Um, God, our Father, our example, he himself was tempted. But we also need to understand that being tempted is not sin. It's what we do afterwards that determines whether it's a sin or not. Uh, when Jesus first uh, got baptized, he went and prayed on the mount for 40 days and 40 nights and was tempted. But he sinned not. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to go to James chapter 4. The seventh verse, and I'm going to tell you exactly why it is that our, that our leader, that our example, Jesus Christ, could be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights and sin not. And it's just as simple as it reads. I won't be before you long. James chapter 4 verse 7 reads, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So we, we that's kind of, it, it's general to say just resist the devil and he'll flee. But what does that resisting look like? Or how do we know that it's going to be easy? You know what I mean? All right. So the resisting part always works because it's in the word. So we know that, but the reason that that's there is because if we indulge in these evil lusts, we already know where it's going. The, the more we indulge, the harder it is for us to walk in our deliverance. A lot of times we get delivered and we think that we haven't been delivered because we're not walking in that deliverance. When God takes the taste of something out of your mouth, it's up to you to make sure you don't go back and pick that taste back up. And the Bible gives us 
a pretty good example of what happens if we do pick that taste back up. Also in James chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 1 through 3. It says, From whence come wars and fighting among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and, come not, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. And ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. What that is saying is, when we begin to stray away from God and indulge in these uh, lustful temptations and these evil desires, we don't even see God anymore. The sense of pride, the, the pride wells up in us and we don't even look to the hills from whence cometh our help. We go on wanting things and trying to do things in all of our power. We're willing to kill our fellow man over the things that we want rather than going to God and asking him for these things. Because when we begin to live according to our purpose, according to our lust, we become our God. So when we want something, we go get it ourselves. And we already know that that's not the way to go. So, <clears throat> sorry about that. These things go to sleep too fast. All right, so that's an example of what can happen if we continue to live according to these lusts and these temptations. And honestly, that sounds pretty depressing <laughs> to know that we're going to be tempted our whole lives, our entire life. We will be tempted. There will always be something bothering us. And in the event that we take one left where we should have went right, we're going to be living in sin. We can, how easily we can surely die. Not a physical death, but a spiritual death, which is far worse. Far worse. And, it, and it's, 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 it's so depressing that sometimes we just begin to condemn ourselves from the temptation, which gives Satan a foothold to push us towards the sin. We're like, oh, I'm tempted again. I can't, I can't, I can't do nothing with this temptation. I already know that this is what I'm subject to. I already know how I respond to things like this. What am I going to do? I guess I'm just going to walk into it again like I always do. And that's once again making yourself your God, feeling like the, the, the precious blood of Jesus that saved you isn't enough to get you over this hump. So, well, but, go to James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. And I'll read it. And it says, My brother, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. When you are tempted, don't give up. It's not sin. It's not a sin to be tempted. So when you are tempted, just realize that it's God exercising your faith to work patience in you, to build your testimony to give you a greater sense of trust with him so you can learn to be vulnerable with him and not lean onto your own understanding. And that brings me to my last point in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I won't read the whole thing. Now, if you've read 2 Corinthians chapter 12 before, this is Paul, and he's talking about the things that he's seen since he became a Christian, since he was actively a follower of Christ. He was talking about how he just seen people healed of their infirmities and how God had gave him supernatural strength and supernatural ability to do a lot of these things. But then he cut himself right off before he got high on his high horse. And he was like, but this ain't about me, though. I can't do this on my own. God made sure that I couldn't do it on my own. And I'm going to read verses 7 through 10 where he went into detail a bit. And it reads, and lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given, oh, pardon me, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. When we tempt it, even, even in, the, even in the, uh, the event that you may fall subject to this temptation, remember that God's grace is sufficient. And the purpose of that thing in your life is to strengthen you, is to build your testimony, so that you can be a viable weapon in the army of the Lord. But you must humble yourself. Just as uh, James chapter 4, verse 10 says, it says, if we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, he will surely lift us up. We have to realize that we can look to the hills for which cometh our help. We don't have it. If we had it, we wouldn't need God. We wouldn't need religion. We wouldn't need anything. We wouldn't need this book because we would know how to make all the right decisions. But we don't. We don't. So we can't prevent the birds from flying over our heads, but we can prevent the birds from making a nest in our hair. You guys be encouraged as you fight the good fight of faith. Amen. a good word from my brother Victor. He that exalts himself shall be abased, but he that humble himself shall be exalted. And we just have to learn that to really touch God, we have to have a spirit of humility, of a spirit of brokenness before him. Because Paul knew when he knew all the scriptures, he was intelligent among those all, but he knew that before he got exalted for all measure, God gave him a thorn of flesh. Hey, Pastor always say um, the thorn um, to um, it's to beat black and blue, to buffet him, to beat black and blue, to polish. You're going to need me. This is a reminder that you cannot do it without me. Amen. Amen. I'm going to introduce to you a sister of mine. I've watched her. She is such a great wife. She is a beautiful wife. She takes care of her husband. I'm like, oh man. Lord bless me one of those, a good thing. I mean, I obtained a favor from the Lord. <laughs> so I just thank God for my sister, um, Courtney. She's very intelligent. And, um, she's um, a leader in her family, ushering in salvation in her bloodline. I'm just honored to in introduce you to her, uh, Courtney Jones. Amen. Let's give a hand clap of praise. For her. Thank you for that wonderful welcome. <laughs> so um, I wanted to speak to you all about something that God had given me a while back when I was growing in my um, faith because I was really trying to learn this thing and kind of about what Victor spoke about, about temptation. And it was so many things around me that was tempting me. And so I found myself just trying to, what can I do to surround myself around Christ, around Christian things to make sure that I'm, um, you know, staying fed and make sure that I'm focused on him. So um, what I wanted to talk to you all about today is don't get caught up in the busyness. So if you can turn to Luke 10, 38 through 42, and I'll be coming from there today. So this is about the story of Mary and Martha. It's Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. So it, said, it reads, now it comes to pass as they went that he entered into the center village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. But Martha was encumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, doubtst thou not care that my sister have left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, and thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing needful, and Mary have chosen that good thing, which shall not be taken from her. So that's the um, King James Version. But basically to explain what's happening there is Jesus came into the house of Mary and Martha to visit them. And Mary um, chose to sit at Jesus' feet and, you know, gain his wisdom, gain his knowledge, just just in, just sit in his um 
his brilliance. And Martha was busy, you know, around the house, picking up things, cleaning up things. And she was upset with her sister because she wasn't helping her out. And so she tells Jesus, you know, tell her to help me. She needs to help me. We have things to do. And he's like, why are you worried about these worldly things? Why are you worried, worried about being so busy with these things that are, um, that have you troubled? Mary's doing something that's, that she's never going to lose. These worldly things, you know, our house being clean, our food on the table, that's going to go away when we pass away. And the only thing that ma- matters is what we store up in heaven with Jesus. And so uh, God was telling her that Mary's doing the right thing. She's at my feet where she needs to be. So, um, so a little bit about my testimony. So like I said, when I was growing in Christ, I was really trying to like avoid things that um, were causing me temptation. So I chose to really focus on, you know, hanging out with uh, people that I knew were Christians to really just kind of learn from them. But also I was getting involved in a lot of organizations and I figured if I'm involved in Christian organizations, then, you know, this will benefit me. I'm going to grow in Christ. And so, um, and so I was at church one day, and the pastor had talked about this story in relation to another topic, and it just God just really gave me the revelation that, Courtney, you're so busy, you're so caught up in the busyness that you're not getting anything from me. You know, I was involved in these organizations, um, you know, doing Christian things and around Christian people, but I wasn't being fed. I wasn't spending time with the Lord. I wasn't growing in Christ. I, I may be around Christian things, but I wasn't growing. And so... Um, so basically, God was, you know, speaking to me like, you're not reading your word enough. You're not praying enough. You're not hearing me. You're not fasting when I'm calling you to fast. So, um, you know, as college students, I completely understand. And I recently graduated last year, and life is completely different. But when you're in college, your life is centered around and focused around school. And, you know, you have to get good grades. You have to get these papers done and whatnot. But take time to just kind of step away and realize that this is only a phase in your life. This is a partial time in your life to really just spend time with God um, and making sure that you're keeping him a priority and not keeping your schoolwork and things like that a priority. Um, During my undergrad career, I studied chemistry, and it was, I don't even know why I decided to do that, but the days when I had exams or papers or lab reports that I had no clue, no clue, I kid you not, of what I was doing, I just turned on my gospel movie and sat there and prayed my way through, and those papers wrote themselves, you know, so when I put God into the mix of what I was doing, things were coming to fruition, things were happening, but when I was trying to do it on my own, I was stressed out and um, and freaking out and worried and everything like that. So um, make sure you just kind of take time to step back and not get caught up in the busyness. And so Ecclesiastics 1.3, and I'll read it for you. It says, What prop- profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? So we don't gain any profit here on earth of any of the earthly things that we gain, of any of the um, things that we're caught up, the organizations that we're involved in, um, our, our grades, our GPA, not saying that doesn't matter, but you can't take those things with you to heaven. Um, and if you read on, Ecclesiastic 1.14 says, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all are in vanity and vexation of the spirit. So, you know, are we doing these things for ourselves? Are we doing these things for our own glory? And then also, are these things conflicting with our spirit, you know, being um, caught up in things that are not of God or things that God hasn't necessarily told you to do? And it could even be being involved in a Christian organization um, or certain things. And so for myself, I was, you know, busy. I'm a planner, so I was busy planning things, getting things set up and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm doing what God wants me to do. And then he basically checked me and was like, yeah, okay, you're involved in this, that, and the other, but you're so busy that you don't have time to spend with me. So with any relationship, we have to take time to build it. Um, So, for example, like I said, I was hanging around a lot of my friends that were uh, Christian because I figured if I'm around more Christians, then I'll grow spiritually. Um, But it wasn't giving me that intimate time that I was supposed to have with God. And so with anybody, if you think about a friend or a significant other, you don't grow in your relationship with them by just um, hanging out with their friends. Or you don't grow in your relationship with them by doing work for them. You grow in your relationship with them by talking to them, getting to know them, spend time with them. So, you know, try your best to um, set that time aside. And so 
you may be like me, okay, it sounds nice in theory, but how do I actually do this? Because I'm a college student, I'm busy, I have things to do. Um, and so if you're the type of person that you're a planner, put it in your schedule. Set aside a time, this is the time I'm going to read my word, this is the time that I'm going to pray. If you're not a planner, then do it when, you, when you're, you always have to eat every day. Or you always have to brush your teeth every day. So make sure that when you're doing that thing that you, okay, I'm going to pray as well while I'm doing this. Or I'm going to, you know, open my Bible while I'm eating or something like that. So that it's in your day that you're incorporating it throughout your day. Um, so I'll leave you with this. Um, like I said, it's really important to spend that time with Jesus and be at his feet because you have no idea what knowledge he wants to give you, the wisdom that he wants to share with you. Um, when I took that time to really just focus on God and not get so caught up in the busyness and I, the way I worked to do it was, okay, I'm involved in certain organizations. Maybe instead of being the planner, how about I, you know, decide to prepare a lesson for that event or something like that where it's making me have to spend time in my word. Um, so, you know, make sure that you take that time to build a relationship with God. Thank you. Sister Courtney was speaking, um, just paraphrasing the scripture, the cares of this world would choke the word out of you. And it like, okay, I got an assignment, I got this, I got bills to pay, I have this. And it's like the flesh, the cares of this world would choke the word out of us. But however, scripture says, uh, cast your cares among the Lord, to the Lord, for his yoke is easy and his burdens are light. And by doing that, we make the choice as Sister Courtney has spoken, um, the wise choice like Mary did by sitting at Jesus' feet, giving it to him. Amen? Amen. I'm just going to actually um, turn it over to our mother in the gospel, uh, Wanda K., beautiful psalmist, anointed by God. She truly loves God with all her heart. And she's going to actually minister us in song as a minister of hope. God, amen? Amen. Um, I pray that this song today will minister to your heart. I believe that that God has has given me this song today to sing for someone that might be here that is desperate, that is just desperately crying out from the depths of your soul and, and that you need an answer from God, that you need direction from God, that you need to feel that you can come back to Jesus. And... I pray that this song will minister to your heart today. gone, my heart is full of sorrow, I can't believe how much I've let you down, I dread the pain that waits for me tomorrow, when the sun reveals my broken dreams scattered on the ground. your grace to make it through. All I have is you. I'm at your mercy. Lord, I'll serve you until my dying day. Help others find a way. believe the God of earth and glory would take the time to care for one like me. But I read in the Bible that old story, how he pled for my forgiveness while he was 
dying lonely tree Please forgive me I need your grace to make it through All I have is you I'm at your mercy Lord, I'll serve you Until my dying day Help others find a way At your mercy Please forgive me I need your grace to make it through All I have is you I'm at your mercy Lord, I'll serve you Until my dying day Help others find a way At your mercy Please forgive me oh. All I have is you I'm at your mercy Are we all in his mercy? When all is said and done, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags, and without his mercy, we are nothing. But thank God that his mercy endureth forever, and his compassions are new every morning. Where would we be without the mercy of God? Without his loving mercy. If you have your Bible, so I want you to turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 11. 2 Samuel, chapter 11. It's probably a somewhat, rather than a popular or a famous story, this is more of an infamous story by someone who was the apple of God's eye a man after God's own heart who had slain his thousands for God, had slain his ten thousands for God, as they would say in the streets for King David. Here was the same man who had brought down the mighty Goliath, a ten-foot giant, that all the men of war were terrified of when he was just a scrawny teenage boy, God used him with just a sling and a stone to bring down the giant. But now here he is. He has risen to a position in his life of prestige. He is king of Israel. He has fought battles and he has won wars. Israel is the mightiest force in the land. Because David has been such a man of war. But in the first verse of chapter 11, it says, And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Reba. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. So David did not go out to battle. David stayed home for the first time. While everyone else fought, while everyone else was facing the battle, while everyone else was dealing with hand-to-hand -hand combat against the enemy, David, their king, their leader, stayed home. And he sat there. 
man, I deserve this. I deserve a rest. I could see him, oh man, I think I'll just have pancakes today. Just lay back, I'm going to eat big breakfast, and then I'm going to, I may even just lay out on my porch and just bask in the sun. So he gets up from his breakfast and he walks out to his deck. And he looks down from the window and he sees this beautiful woman bathing. She's naked. Man, she's pretty. She is gorgeous. And he sends one of his servants, he says, who is that? Who is that woman? And the servant says, that's Bathsheba, the daughter of, I forget the, her father's name, but the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David said, well, have her come for a visit. And so she came up, and David had his way with her. He thought, man, that was fun. I haven't felt this good in a long time. I deserve this. I've been fighting for God. I've been dealing with the enemies. Oh, man, all the stuff I've been missing. I'm king now. I can have anything I want. The rules that apply to everyone else don't apply to me because of my position. But something happened. Bathsheba was with child from David. And her husband Uriah is out in the battle, been there for months. And like any sin, it always takes us farther than we intended to go, doesn't it? I know some of you would like to just pigeonhole this to simply adultery. But think it, as I'm sharing this with you, think of what your Bathsheba is. What is your Bathsheba? And so Bathsheba sent word to David that she was with his child, pregnant with his child. And so David thought, oh man, oh, what an inconvenience now. I gotta fix this. See, covers it up. I'm going to cover it up. So he sends for Uriah to come home. He had a good plan. It would work. And they didn't have DNA testing back then. And he, he says, Uriah, he, he had dinner with the king. He said, I want you to go down to your wife and just enjoy yourself. He got Uriah all drunk. And Uriah was such a man of integrity. All he could think about was his brothers that were fighting the war that he was dedicated to and he committed himself to and many that were lives were in danger. And he would not go down to his wife. Instead, he stayed outside at the walls of the city. And David sent word for him the next morning. He said, what's the matter? Why didn't you go down to your wife? And he said, I couldn't because my brothers are in battle. I just couldn't go and have my, be with my wife and be with my family and enjoy myself while I know my brothers are fighting. They're in pain. They're sleeping on the ground and they're suffering and sacrificing. And so... David thought to himself, I gotta do something. I gotta fix this. He says, okay. He says, I'll give you a letter. 
And he gave him his own death letter, sealed by the king to Uriah. And he had to carry it, carry it to Joab, the captain of David's army, the Israelite army. And in the letter, he told Joab to put Uriah the Hittite at the forefront of the battle to ensure that he would be killed. And so when they went to battle against the enemy, Job, Joab had the other soldiers hold back while Uriah was just fighting for everything within him. And he was slain by the enemy. And then Israel jumped in and won the war. Sent a letter back to David and saying that you know, a lot of the men got too close to the wall. We won the battle, but Uriah, that servant, Uriah the Hittite, is dead. And so David gave Bathsheba time to mourn for a few days, and then he sent for her to come to be his wife. What a deceptive, degrading, and malicious, and just horrific, evil deed by the man of God. Amen. And David thought, I've covered it up. Nobody knows. It's covered. Nobody knows. And so he was going whistling through the palace one day. And he's got it all covered. And here comes this inconvenient prophet Nathan knocking on the door. He wants to speak with David and he comes and just tells David a strange story about a shepherd who's, who had only one sheep that he kept as a child. It was like it was his pet that he, he kept with him. He loved it so much. And here was a rich man who had company coming to his house. And instead of, of the rich man killing his own sheep, to feed to his guest, he took the poor man's one sheep that he had and he slayed it and he fed that to his guest. His own little lamb. And David, when he heard that story, he said, who did that? He said, I, I'll cut his head off. He needs to die right now. Who is it? We're, I'll, I'll make sure he's dead. And you know that people who are covering sin have a high level of judgment toward others. You ever notice that? People who are hiding with living in secret sin, they have a harsh judgment of others typically. And Nathan looks at David and he says, points his finger at David, and he says, thou art the man. Thou art the man. And David, <gasps> he could breathe. He his persona changed, his walk changed. He had been walking in arrogance, thought that he could not be touched, and his world came crashing down, and he repented. But one thing about David, he always knew, I can't survive without the presence of God. And he went to God, and he cried out. In Psalm 51, he said, have mercy 
And this prayer was a result of his sin with Bathsheba. Had he not been able to pray this prayer from his heart, I don't know what would have happened to David. Victor was talking about coming before the Lord humbly. If we are to get to God, it's got to be humble that we come before him, broken before him. And David said, have mercy upon me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Cleanse me, wash me thoroughly from my sin, and cleanse me from my iniquity, for it was against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. O thou desirest truth in the inward parts, O Lord, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and uphold me with thy free spirit. Restore and cast not, take not the Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Sometimes people get in that trap. They just give up. Or they just keep trying to cover it up. Just keep trying to, to make sure nobody finds out. They live one life over here and they live another life over there. Just constantly trying to cover it up. Put out the fires here and there. But I feel like this morning that God wants to, us to come to Him. Broken and in total surrender. I don't know why this has been laid on my heart so strongly today, but I feel it so strongly. Wanda K sang that song. Um, what's the, the guy, English, that used to sing that? Michael English. I don't know if you all have ever heard of him. Michael English. who become su He became such a popular, popular gospel music singer. He became, actually became a millionaire. He was so popular and had his song sold so much. He became a millionaire. But he thought he was invincible. And he began to partake of things that was displeasing to God. Committed adultery against his wife. Besides lots of other sins. And his world came crashing down. And out of, the, out of the loneliness and despair and the brokenness of years of feeling separated from the church and from the call of God in his life, he began to sing that song in desperation. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. How many times we've had to cry that song from the depths of our soul. God, you called me out of darkness into your marvelous light. You gave me a divine purpose. You chose me. You ordained me. God, every person here, every one of us, children of God that he loves. But how many times we have been eating with the swine, running from slipping and sliding, peeking and hiding.
thinking that we can get around God. And God sees all the time with his heart grieved. The Bible said that when David, when God saw what David did, he said it displeased the Lord. It displeased, displeased the Lord. And that's how I feel like this morning there's some things in our life, some Bathshebas, that have displeased the Lord. That we need to surrender to Him this morning and cry out to Him from the depths of our soul. And it has to begin with a fresh start and a new beginning. And I'm going to read one verse before we... I want to, I'll read one verse to you, and then I'm going to have Wanda Kay come and sing that song again. In Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And verse 13 and 14. It says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Satan even if you, even though you failed God, even though I failed God, many times in our lives, we've got to put it behind. And, and the scripture says, forgetting those things which are behind. It's not that we can annihilate it from our mind, but it's like it's compared to a race. It's a process. And if we're running, if we're running, you know, if someone's running, I used to run track in high school. And if I look back to see how close the person was behind me, it would slow me down. Like Jarek's a trackster. And I'd run, and if I look back, it's, I, it would slow me down. And so what happens a lot of times is we're running this race for the Lord. We keep looking back of where we come from. And times we slow up and we kind of greet up with it again, don't we? But Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind. In other words, I don't look back there. I know they're there. I know it happened. My past and my past. All the heartache and all the struggles that I've had and everything I've brought against myself and against everybody and how I've hurt my friends and how I've hurt my family and how I've hurt the people that care about me. I know that I've done those things. I know that I've felt God. I know that I brought heartache to so many, but I have poured my soul out to God and I've repented before God and I've asked for His mercy and His compassion and His renewal and His restoration. So I'm not going to look back there again because it's only going to pull me back down. It's only going to hinder me. I have my heart, my heart is fixed, oh God. My face is set like a flint and I'm going to press toward the mark of the high calling of God which is in Christ Jesus. You've called me away from that and Lord, Lord, I'm running. I'm running. I'm not going to let that catch up to me again. I'm not going to fall prey to that again. I'm going to walk with you, Jesus. I got to keep on running. I got to run faster because I can't let that my past catch up with me again. I'm going for the prize. God wants you to go for the prize. The prize which is in Christ Jesus. Our Lord, sometimes it's a press. Every demonic force is trying to hinder you from that. Every demonic force this morning is trying to stop you from even caring this morning and saying, what's the use? But I tell you, the prize is worth it. It's indescribable. Indescribable. The prize that God has for you. 
Would you stand with me this morning as one decay begins to sing this song? We're going to open up this altar this morning. And I want you to come and I want you to bring all of your cares to Jesus this morning. All that you've been through, all the things, I think of some of the things I've done in my past to hurt my mother, the things I've done in my past to embarrass my family, the things that I've done in my past to embarrass myself and bring heartache to the, my friends and loved ones that cared so much about me and how I've let them down so many times. But Satan wants to suck me back into that past. But God has a prize ahead as long as I keep pressing toward the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Though all the world recall my past, though all the world remember, Jesus, don't let me look back. Jesus, don't let me see. I just want you, Jesus. I just want you, Jesus. And as Wanda K sings this song, just open it. Be real with God this morning. Don't hold anything back. Just, just be true to him. Be completely honest. Stop trying to cover it up. Stop trying to, to hide it. Stop trying to, to, to make excuses for it and say it's okay because everybody else does it. Just stop it. God knows and you really know. Down in the depths of your soul, God has heard the silent scream of What's going on inside of you and a detriment and an embarrassment and a heartache and the turmoil that this has caused you and how it's taken peace from your life. God wants to restore you completely this morning. He wants to make you new again. Hallelujah. Surrender to him right now. Praise God. Just be real with him right now. is gone. My heart is full of sorrow. I can't believe how much I've let you down. I dread the pain that waits for me tomorrow. When the sun reveals my broken dreams scattered on your grace to make it through. All I have is you. I'm at your mercy. Oh, I need your mercy, Jesus. Lord, I'll serve you until my dying day. Help others find the way at your God of earth and glory would take the time to care for one like me. But I read in the Bible that old story how he pled for my forgiveness while he hung upon I need your grace to make it through. Lord, all I have is you. I'm at your mercy. Lord, I'll serve you until my dying day. Help others find the way at your mercy. your grace to make it through. Lord, all I have is you. I'm at your mercy. 